Each of the manifold horrors of the galaxy is enough to drive a human insane. Xenos monstrosities, otherworldly sorcerers, and unholy aberrations from darkest nightmares plague mankind. Against everything that threatens humanity's survival stand the massed ranks of the Astra Militarum. In a galaxy sometimes without light and often without hope, they fight and die that others shall not. From the million worlds of the Imperium, their immense armies march endlessly to war. Countless soldiers, heavy battle tanks, thunderous artillery, and sky-darkening flights of gunships are commanded by iron-willed officers whose chain of command is ruthlessly enforced. Not for naught is the Astra Militarum known as the Hammer of the Emperor. Occasionally unwieldy, often indiscriminate, it is the Imperium's weapon of total and unrelenting force. To be a soldier in one of the Astra Militarum's unnumbered armies is to be one amongst hundreds of thousands of all two mortal warriors. Yet, it is also to be a part of humanity's greatest ever war machine, and to lend one's faith, strength, and hate to that engine of devastation as it crushes all before it through sheer brute force. Hammer of the Emperor The Astra Militarum is the largest coherent fighting force in the galaxy. Unnumbered human troops, supported by legions of heavy armor and thundering artillery, are fed into war zones across the galaxy every day. Through hellish wars of attrition, desperate invasions, and years-long sieges, the Imperial Guard fight a never-ending war for mankind's survival. The Imperium is vast on a scale incomprehensible to ordinary humans. Communication and travel between the glinting moats of this far-flung empire are laden with risk. The inimical realm of the warp provides the only conduit for interstellar movement or messages. Yet it also taints or temporarily displaces much of that which plunges into its depths, confounding the Imperium's attempts at a centralized control or unified strategy. On every border and every battlefront, humanity's worst nightmares press ever inwards, and are held at bay only through vast and constant sacrifice. In these dark times, warfare on a galactic scale is a matter of soulless, grinding logistics. Only the Astra Militarum can marshal the vast numbers to fight such wars. Astra Militarum formations are the Imperium's mainstay fighting force. Those deployed to a given war zone, ranging from companies of mere hundreds drawn from a single world, to army groups comprising soldiers and armored vehicles from multiple regiments, plus auxiliary and support battalions. Though they often support more elite formations, many of mankind's largest wars are fought by the Imperial Guard alone. 
These forces fight punishing battles of attrition, in which incalculable lives may be expended for each objective achieved. An Imperial Guard army must utilize the twin advantages of vast numbers and overwhelming firepower to annihilate its foes. Where Xenos aircraft dance and weave with impossible grace, the Imperial Guard fills the sky with a thunderstorm of munitions that no amount of aerobatic skill can outmaneuver. Where heretical bastions stand defiant, Imperial Guard commanders call down artillery bombardments that reduce all to rubble. The greatest enemy threats are torn apart in the crossfire of thousands of heavy weapons, or smashed aside by the gallant charge of hundreds of Imperial tanks, while enemy infantry are cut down in disciplined volleys of lasfire or impaled upon forests of bayonets. The enemies of mankind may employ dark sciences, supernatural powers, or xenos weapons beyond humanity's ken. But such deviance comes to naught in the face of honest human intolerance. Fed by a wellspring of faith in the God Emperor, and backed by sufficient guns. For all the might of its armor and artillery, the true backbone of the Astra Militarum is the countless waves of infantry who take the field. The sheer scale of the battles fought by the Imperial Guard is dehumanizing in the extreme. Entire regiments of brave warriors are reduced to statistics upon the scrolling screens of Imperial Strategos. Grains of sand sliding through the fingers of greater and more privileged individuals. Yet, every single company, every single squad, every single Imperial Guardsman who lifts their las guns and takes a stand in defense of their race is crucial. Without a constant deluge of new recruits, the Astra Militarum would cease to function. It is one of the most important functions of the Departmento Munitorum to ensure that the Astra Militarum's ranks are constantly refilled. This mammoth organization forms the military bureaucracy of the far larger administratum and constitutes the general staff of the Imperial Guard. The Departmento Munitorum monitors tithes imposed on almost all Imperial worlds. The bulk of these tithes are paid in the flesh of a world's sons and daughters. Often conscripted, these soldiers are raised as regiments and sent out to uphold their planet's pride on some distant battlefield. Other tithes are paid in material, anything from uniforms and rations to high explosive shells and super heavy battle tanks. The Departmento Munitorum administers the Imperium's numerous war zones. Its agents gather armies for each, liaise with the Navis Imperialis to transport them there, and, in the feared forms of commissars, ensure the loyalty of soldiers and officers once they reach the front lines. The unique demands of a war zone the particular requests of senior officers, the availability of nearby recruiting worlds, or in transit forces, the tumultuous nature of the warp, all must be weighed against the importance of the world under threat. The 
organization of an imperial response can take months, even years. Ill-suited regimental types may be forced together out of necessity. Soldiers from arid planets may be deployed to fight on ice worlds. Armies might even arrive to find the world they aimed to save long since dead. That sufficient Astra Militarum regiments arrive at any war zone at all is a testament to the untold millions of troops dispatched every day. A Glorious Tapestry Individual regiments and their worlds of origin, should they ever hear of their soldiers' deeds at all, glorify the noble victories of their warriors. Famous last stands, tales of selfless sacrifice, and epic crusades across the stars are embroidered and aggrandized, held up as the ideal that the common soldier should aspire to, in histories sometimes dating back millennia. Dust-covered tapestries in the deepest of the Departmento Munitorum's archives hint at the Astra Militarum's founding. During the brutal reorganizations that swept the Imperium in the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, what had been the Imperial Army ceased to exist. By a great treatise, the Tactica Imperium, the link between mankind's fleets and its armies was severed, as was the power the posthuman Adeptus Astartes had held over immense mortal armies. No longer, it was hoped, would individuals be able to muster the combined forces required to strike at entire sectors without Terra's authority. Though huge portions of the Imperial Army turned traitor during the heresy, faded frescoes proclaim that countless more stayed loyal, and a handful of regiments continue to claim lineage from those formations. Though no connection can ever be proved to such distant times, many guardsmen of the era Indominus feel an intense amount of pride that, like their forebears of ages past, they fight in the name of the Emperor. Fragmentary legends and disassociated names from that time echo through the Imperial Guard's myths to the present. Stories of selfless Olanius Pius, the almost certainly fictitious Bresfet companions, and the final sally of Darrow Alpha Brigade have been repeated and altered the galaxy over. In the centuries after the Horus Heresy, with the spreading of the Imperial Creed, priests of the growing Adeptus Ministorum accompanied Imperial armies. These zealots found eager new adherents amongst the regiments of the Astra Militarum, and used the Imperium's growing religion to unify armies from clashing cultures. So too did adepts of the Machine God reaffirm their loyalty by maintaining their Engine Seer agents amongst mankind's armies. They aided the Imperial Guard's conquests by soothing the weapons of war required to crush heretics and Xenos. The triumphs and tragedies of a single Segmentum's armies during the age of the Imperium, would occupy several hundred lifetimes of an army of scribes to collate. To present a cogent history of the Astra Militarum's exploits, then, is impossible. Yet there are noteworthy conflicts 
in which its amassed ranks played a pivotal role. After the Horus Heresy, Astra Militarum armies waged retributive campaigns as part of the scouring against the fleeing heretics that had assailed Terra, driving many into the depths of the Eye of Terror. The Cadian system and its fortress world Cadia became a bastion against heretical and warp-spawned invasions. The growing power of the Ecclesiarchy came to a head during the infamous Reign of Blood, which marked the Age of Apostasy. High Lord of the Administratum, Goge Vandire, the Department Munitorum already under his control, seized yet greater power as Ecclesiarch. At his command, Astra Militarum regiments enforced his tyranny on countless worlds. Loyalist regiments rallying to the banner of the itinerant preacher Sebastian Thor joined with other imperial forces that eventually ensured the despot's defeat. The Black Crusades of Abaddon the Despoiler and growing number of Xenos war at the Imperium, though hope flared all too briefly even in the darkest of decades. In the 41st millennium, Lord Commander Solar Macarius led an epic crusade into the Segmentum Pacificus, conquering a thousand worlds. But war zones beyond count called for ever greater tithes of soldiers. Orc invasions of Armageddon eclipsed rumors of an earlier war there. The Damocles Crusade against the burgeoning Tau Empire and the defense of Ultramar during the First Tyrannic War consumed dozens of regiments, while the forces of the Dark Gods multiplied. Some pointed to these events as omens, yet none amongst the wise claimed to have foreseen the opening of the Great Rift. The Fall of Cadia The fortress world of Cadia had been the linchpin in the Imperium's defense against traitor forces, raiding from the Eye of Terror for nigh on 10,000 years. Standing guard over the critical Cadian Gate region, the planet and its soldiers symbolized stoic duty against horrific odds. Their inviability embedded in the wider Imperial Guard's consciousness. It was immediately before the opening of the Great Rift at the culmination of Abaddon the Despoiler's 13th Black Crusade that Cadia fell at last. The planet had provided the Imperium with a cast-iron stronghold from which Imperial Guard campaigns had, for millennia, taken the fight to heretic fleets, cult uprisings, and demonic incursions. It had held fast against multiple invasions by traitors, mutants, and the monstrously powerful heretic Astartes. Each attempt to conquer Cadia had been repulsed, though at an increasingly immense cost to the regiments that defended its bastions, star forts, trench lines, and bunkers. Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, however, unleashed chaos-worshipping heretics in numbers not seen since the Horus Heresy. Under sustained assault, the Astra Militarum on Cadia 
endured as Abaddon poured more and more of his limitless forces into crushing the world that had defied him. Thunderous artillery bombardments pounded the invaders. Massed Cadian tank divisions dueled with renegade armor formations through the city's outskirts. Cadian shock troops grimly held defensive positions, and the world's elite, the Kasserkin, launched precision strikes against the heretics, while other imperial forces mustered to repel enemy advances. The rallying cry of Cadia Stands was taken up by imperial guardsmen, and heard amongst the fortified Kassars of Cadia and elsewhere. The term Kassar being applied to both Cadia's militarized cities and to some of its fortress-like sister planets. No greater symbol was there of this will to push the heretics back than Ursicar E. Creed, the Lord Castellan, of Cadia. Formerly the colonel of the Cadian Eighth, Creed was granted overwhelming authority as Lord Castellan of Cadia, after a gross betrayal resulted in the assassination of Cadian High Command. Creed let the defenders stand from the fortress of Kassar Kraft. His foresight to reinforce the defenses of Cadia and to transmit ceaseless calls for aid bought a little time. Countless regiments of Imperial Guardsmen, amongst them many of Cadia's lauded shock troops, as well as forces of Adeptus Astartes and Adeptus Sororitas, flooded the fortress world. Despite these reinforcements, the defense was not enough. At the campaign's zenith of bloodshed, Abaddon sent a sabotaged Blackstone fortress plummeting from orbit into Cadia's surface. The colossal and ancient void station's impact would be the final death blow for Cadia and its inexorable approach through the atmosphere was like that of a burning comet. Creed vowed to remain, leading a rearguard action to enable as many as possible to escape the doomed world. When the ancient craft hit, continents cracked. Fire, tsunamis, and hurricanes scoured the surface as the world's death throes were triggered. The warp, held back for so long, greedily enveloped Cadia. Anything that still lived on the planet's surface becoming a plaything for demons. Of nearly a billion souls who stood to defend Cadia, scarcely three million were evacuated. Lord Castellan Creed and the remnants of the Cadian Eighth were not amongst them. Though their home planet was utterly sundered, the resolve of the Cadians has not been broken. Veteran survivors of the last battle for Cadia, along with regiments of their kin scattered throughout the galaxy, now fight even more doggedly against the Imperium's enemies. Old generations of shock troopers are born, raised, and trained en route to war zones, and soldiers from other worlds with the metal to withstand Cadian training are inducted into their ranks. The mantra, Cadia stands, oft repeated during the planet's violent final days, has gained purchase within the officer corps 
and amongst the platoons. For Arcadia does indeed still stand. They assert as long as a single Cadian soldier continues to fight. The grit and determination with which Cadia was so valiantly defended for all those millennia has long been lauded within the Astra Militarum. The professionalism of the world's soldiers remain influential not only as inspiration to fuel lurid trench line tales, but also through tactica pinned by Cadian generals that are studied in regimental academies. Rare demobilized regiments of Cadians, granted rights of settlements on worlds they conquered, instill Cadia's legendary discipline into their new societies. Other regiments model their recruitment and training practices on Cadian doctrine, or seek to equip their forces in the Cadian style. All are eager to emulate a world so heavily militarized that it was said its people were taught how to field strip and shoot a las gun before they could even read. Cadia's surviving sons and daughters refused to allow the destruction of their home world to keep them from unleashing the Emperor's wrath on their foes. The dauntless spirit in the face of ceaseless enemies masks several darker sentiments amongst the Cadian troops that continue to fight. Widespread hatred for mankind's enemies has deepened to a zealous degree. Many Cadians see their homeworld's fall as a personal failure and fight all the harder to regain what they perceive as lost honor. Some of those who were not present for the planet's tragic end resent those who failed in its defense or else feel guilt for playing no part themselves. Others scorn the regiments of worlds they believed failed to aid Cadia in its darkest hour, and oppose the use of soldiers from other worlds to expand Cadian regiments, loath to share the burden of loss. In the view of many Imperial Guardsmen, the planet broke before the Guard did. The sacrifice of Ursicar Creed and those under his command only reinforced for many the bloody-mindedness and hard-faced demeanor of the Astra Militarum. The men and women of the regiments of Lost Cadia will continue to wade into unremitting firestorms and battle through trenches choked with blood and mud. Alongside deafening salvos from armored behemoths, they will advance into the teeth of enemy fire if that is where their orders lead them. They will do so again and again, continuing to fight until the day every traitor and thrall to the dark gods is defeated at last and their world avenged a thousand times over. The Era Indominus Humanity's response to the cataclysm of the Cicatrix Maledictum, the outpourings of heretics and traitors, the surges of mutation and Xenos aggression, was not the spiteful lash of a dying beast. It was the roar of a titan on the warpath and its manifestation was arguably greater than the mythic battle groups and armies said to have been loosed in the Great Crusade. Millions of Imperial Guardsmen had fallen on Cadia alone. Innumerably more were wiped down with the tearing open of the Great Rift. 
and the concomitant eruptions of warp storms old and new, or perished fighting the hellish enemies that had boiled out of their depths. The fate of half the galaxy, designated the Imperium Nihilus, remained unknown beyond the Great Rift. While threats of every conceivable evil assailed thousands of systems within the Imperium Sanctus. Everywhere, it seemed to the overburdened staff officers and Lord General of the Astra Militarum, Warzone commanders demanded urgent logistical support and mountains of additional ammunition cried out for desperately needed reserves, or worse, fell ominously silent. Tithes were increased on already suffering worlds. Vicious conscription drives emptied entire hive cities. Heightened output needs pushed industrial worlds to their limits in desperate attempts to make up shortfalls. Each Militarum Regimentum, the total forces of a given world that fall under the remit of Astra Militarum, was stretched to breaking point. Their individual regiments needed as never before. Rabute Gilliman's Indomitus Crusade was but one answer to the hurricane of woes that daily beset him as Lord Commander of the Imperium. Between Gilliman, his senior commanders, and his army of bureaucrats in the Officio Logisticarum, the Herculean effort of gathering the Crusade fleets began. To secret mustering points throughout the Sol system and beyond, thousands of regiments converged joining with space marines, sisters of battle, the cybernetic hosts of the Adeptus Mechanicus, and more. Yet this was only the beginning. Each fleet's battle groups, once launched, fitfully made their way through the churning warp on predetermined courses, where they came to systems miraculously spared carnage they each reaped a harvest of yet more regiments. Where their task forces found worlds in the grip of invasion, the Imperial Guard's regiments of massed infantry, battle tanks, and artillery almost always formed the vast majority of every crusade force. In the wake of each victory, reinforcements from the recently saved world were demanded to replenish the ravaged ranks and replace wrecked vehicles. The fleets of the Indomitus Crusade continue Gilliman's vision of pushing back the corrupting armies of Chaos and those enacting Xenos' tyranny. Gilliman's objectives stretched beyond mere attack, however. His officio logisticarum was granted the authority to requisition tithed regiments for the protection of its own adepts and their hub fortresses. And senior Astra Militarum officers were ever amongst the luminary nobles and warrior generals assembled by the Indomitus Crusade. The demands of this crusade placed upon the Astra Militarum were unparalleled, as the battle groups moved from system to system, they subsumed innumerable newly raised regiments to replace their losses and swell their combat assets. Many regiments were also deployed to the Officio Logisticarum's hub fortresses in the Crusade's mustering sites, and commanders of the Crusade were instructed to found and man new hub fortresses in conquered systems. Gilliman's ambitious aims for the Indominus Crusade 
were vital for the Imperium's future. But the battlefields its fleets were destined for made up only a fraction of the war zones the Imperial Guard fought in. Within thousands of subsectors that lay nowhere near the path of any Indominus battle group, Astra Militarum forces were dispatched to new or escalating war fronts on a daily basis. Coordinated by the masters of localized Departmento Munitorum officios and their armies of scribes, adepts, logisticians, and strategos. Infantry regiments, armored battalions, artillery divisions, and super heavy tank companies were constantly deployed and redeployed, reinforced, consolidated, or evacuated. The grinding logistics involved in moving huge numbers of troops and material through storm-tossed warp channels only compounded this undertaking, adding its own dangers and delays. Xenos invasions were confronted, orcs and tyranids in the Octarius sector, Necrons in the Uranius cluster, Eldari raiders in the Deshka subsector, to name but some. Multiplying cult uprisings were crushed and uprooted, some in thrall to the dark gods of chaos, others bearing Xenos mutations or ideas, or fighting for successionist tenets fueled by political or religious heresy. Only three of the five Lord Commanders of the Segmente Majoris were in tentative contact with the wider Imperium. Of these, Leontis, the Lord Commander of Solar, was arguably the most embattled. The Segmentum Solar, home to Terra itself, was assailed from without by heretic fleets and countless Xenos and from within by insurgents and traitors. Leontis refused to allow such threats to come to fruition under his watch. The Chain of Command The Astra Militarum, for all its colossal size and necessarily decentralized organization, is built on a labyrinthian but rigid hierarchy. Discipline is ruthlessly enforced, and a fortified chain of command exists, ensuring every soldier, from the rawest recruit to the most decorated officer, knows their place in an unbroken line of authority, stretching ultimately to the emperor. The titular head of the Departmento Munitorum is the Lord Commander Militant. This august individual represents the organization and the entire Astra Militarum before the Senate Imperialis, and hence, through that body's holy authority, before the Emperor himself. So great is the Lord Commander Militant's power and influence that they are often appointed one of the High Lords of Terra, but rarely leave the throne world. In theory, the Lord Commander of a Segmentum gives orders to various sector officers and subsector commanders, who in turn relay orders to the individual Militarum Regimentos. In this way, the wishes of the High Lords of Terra are enacted by the Departmento Munitorum. In practice, the immense distances and delays in communication between worlds often make a mockery 
of such procedures, and the sheer scale of the Imperium prevents any meaningful central governance. Operational control of Astra Militarum forces in a given war zone is thereby assumed by a high-ranking Militarum Regimentum officer, carrying a title such as General, High Marshal, or Lord Hetman, who assumes responsibility for the completion of their given duties. This might be the initiation of a decades-long conflict to cleanse a star system of savage greenskins, or it could involve the protection of cryptosite mines or promethium refineries from pirate raids. Just as common are military recolonizations of planets lost from the Imperium's fold. Whatever the task, the commander of the war zone's forces is responsible for the deployment and application of all resources at their disposal. Beneath a force's overall ground commander and their numerous attaches, advisors, and support staff are the individual regiments and their commanding officers. Each Militarum Regimentum comprises multiple regiments, all of which come from the same planet or system because of the shared culture and fighting styles of regiments sourced from a single world, soldiers, officers, and even officials of the Departmento Munitorum often interchange the term Militarum Regimentum and Regiment, referring to all Imperium Guardsmen from Cadia, as being from the Cadian Regiment, for example. On their home worlds, the forces who serve to defend the planet may be split into cohorts, militia groups, geno corps, or a host of other formations known by a variety of local terms. But in the Astra Militarum, these are all considered different types of regiment. Regiments are usually divided into multiple companies according to the tenets of the Tactica Imperium, each placed under the command of a senior officer. The number of companies depends upon the regiment's type and size, but may range from as few as three to several dozen. Companies are further divided into platoons or squadrons, and infantry platoons typically comprise an officer their staff, and several squads of Imperial Guardsmen, each led by a sergeant. Combined Arms Regiments Especially capable officers know that while the indiscriminate bludgeon of overwhelming force can eventually secure victory, sometimes more efficient measures must be taken. Combined arm regiments meld solid cores of infantry or armor with numerous supporting elements that can, together, grant victory over any foe. Except in rare circumstances, or within certain isolated sectors whose logistical strategies have deviated through necessity or laxity, True combined armed regiments are not normally raised within the Astra Militarum. Although there are many different classes of Imperial Guard Regiment, each one is largely homogeneous in its composition. Infantry regiments, for example, are unlikely to contain much or any heavy artillery, while tank regiments contain little to no infantry. Success requires Astra Militarum regiments to work together. While this interdependence may at first seem like a weakness, 
it is a necessary precaution should a regiment rebel against the emperor. The traitors will not have access to the supporting units needed to prosecute a full-scale war. Though a regiment may be equipped to function in a single role, battlefield reality often necessitates the interweaving of numerous tactical operations. Disastrous friendly fire tragedies by artillery or tank companies or massacres of uncoordinated supporting infantry under the heavy treads of allied armor are usually seen as sufficiently wasteful to warrant cross-tactical training. Several imperial worlds specialize in producing highly integrated formations of this kind, and such regimens are keenly sought by campaign commanders. What are commonly termed combined arms forces are usually formations comprising several separate regiments, or portions thereof. Typically, such forces are conceived in the army's strategium well in advance of a given operation, and revolve around a core role. Infantry companies of the highly disciplined Cadian shock troops are particularly famed for forming the cores of especially successful combined arms regiments. Supported by squadrons of battle tanks to provide mobile heavy firepower and artillery to disrupt enemy cohesion, such troops are able to fan out, seizing ground and protecting their lumbering allies from the dangers of enemy infantry. Other combined arms forces are anchored by a core of tank companies, batteries of heavy artillery, or even exotic militarum auxilla forces, such as ratlings and ogrins. Such formations are created through circumstance, or where the foe's capabilities are unknown despite the best efforts of intelligence officers and the mountains of data fed into the thrumming cogitator banks aboard orbiting vessels. Should a regiment survive a campaign, it is unlikely that it will return to its home world, moving instead from one war zone to another. As casualties reduce the overall strength of fighting forces, regiments are often amalgamated so that, united, they can continue to wage the Emperor's wars. Where possible, two half-strength regiments from the same Militarum Regimentum will combine, but it is not uncommon for two disparate cultures to find themselves brothers in arms. In some cases, two or more regiments of entirely different roles may be forced together, as occurred with the Valhallen 611th Infantry Regiment and the 1082nd Recon Armored Division. This resulted in a highly unorthodox mechanized regiment with a high casualty rate. The Voltan Recon Hussars, whose infantry clung to the holes of tanks that had no capacity to transport them in safety. Many commanders declare that the reduced efficiency of these combined regiments makes them barely worth their rations. Conflicting doctrines and mutually unintelligible languages forming barriers to integration and cultural clashes and seething mistrust further hamper their battlefield cohesion. Other officers are interested only in the number of soldiers that can be fielded, regardless of origin. 
their successful integration as fighting units a secondary concern. With few exceptions, new recruits are not added to existing regiments. Understrength formations are instead simply merged together. Where possible, the formations are joined from the same home world, as was the case when the Cadian 12th and 78th were combined after the fall of Icehive Magnox. Sometimes, however, two very different regiments are combined, such as when the Catacan 182nd was merged with the Elysian 90th. As this took place on the Departmento Munitorum world of Prosan, the composite regiment was designated the Prosan 314th. The new regiment became expert in air mobile jungle warfare after being issued Valkyries during the Se Kong Justification Wars. Death World Regiments Amongst the worlds inhabited by Imperial citizens, there are many on which even basic existence is a battle fought every single day. Designated Death Worlds by the Administratum, these planets are ideal recruiting grounds for the Astra Militarum, as they forge populations hardened to lives of constant struggle, little different to the hardships of the Imperium's endless wars. Death worlds are those that are theoretically capable of sustaining human life, but whose conditions represent an almost certain death sentence for those not accustomed to their rigors. In the case of some, it may be the climate or environment that is deadly. Exoriating radiation, lashing electrical storms, or poisonous fumes can kill unprotected inhabitants. Rampant volcanic activity, razor-sharp mica hurricanes, and tectonic fluxes can flatten structures. On other death worlds, the plant life may be injurious to mankind releasing psychotoxins or mutagens into the air or water, rupturing foundations or preying more directly on passers-by. Many, meanwhile, harbor varieties of animals, from the microscopic to the gargantuan, that infest, hunt, or unknowingly crush formative human societies before they even have a chance to take hold. Some death worlds even exhibit all of these features. The human inhabitants of death worlds are survivors, the ones whose far-off ancestors somehow managed to cling to life during their first years as colonists. They are commonly alert with instincts heightened to danger, emotions inured to loss, and ingrained with a respect for those they know to be more experienced. After all, where death worlders come from, inattention and wayward behavior can lead to a painful demise. Their rapid adoption of orders alone, at least, from those respected officers who have shared their hardships, makes them ideally suited to life in the Imperial Guard. The skills with which Death Worlders are able to overcome the dangers of their native environments can benefit any general taking charge of such regiments. Some of these formations are characterized by soldiers with vastly increased muscle mass, such as the fearsome Katakans, who some call baby ogrins, denser bones or increased immunities. 
Such changes may have arisen through enforced isolation and a biological need to adapt in order to survive. Others may be the result of genetic experimentation with now lost technologies or the pervasive use of stem cocktails. On the whole, death world regiments are incredibly adaptable in the face of sudden threats, a trait not widely seen within the usually lumbering Astra Militarum war machine. Abrupt assaults by unseen foes, rapid changes in temperature and humidity, or seemingly impassable terrain not foreseen by regimental intelligence, all bring out the survivalist spirit of death worlders. Reconnaissance outposts, hunting parties, and eagle-eyed pickets are readily formed from those used to safeguarding against ravening beasts. Gorges are forded and foundering battle tanks righted by those familiar with crossing icy canyons or negotiating quake-riven landscapes. Feats that would otherwise require combat engineers or the specialists of the Adeptus Mechanicus. To these hardy men and women, war in service to the Emperor simply transplants one set of life and death struggles for another. Mechanized Infantry Regiments Some war zones call for swift advances, often under heavy enemy fire. Conditions in which foot-slogging Imperial Guardsmen would soon perish without appreciable gains to show for their deaths. Whether redeploying infantry to new battlefields or carrying them into blitzkrieg assaults, mechanized regiments form a wall of steel that enables more troops to enter the fight. Fully equipped with transport tanks, mechanized infantry regiments are more mobile than almost any Astra Militarum formation. In addition to being deployed in their entirety, squads or companies may be detached and assigned to more unwieldy forces. In this way, they provide a rapid response capability to plug breaches in defensive lines or encircle more static foes to bring the Emperor's wrath from a different angle. These speeding steel-armored units are often known as armored fist squads. Entire mechanized infantry regiments are invaluable to commanders in war zones whose multiple smaller engagements are widespread, or where the enemy is too swift to be pinned down by more ponderous regiments. They are often used to forge ahead of the main advance to seize vital ground until the amassed ranks of infantry regiments arrive to garrison their gains, at which point the mechanized forces move on to fresh targets. Other tactics often utilized by such regiments include massed reconnaissance observation, breakthroughs into pockets to allow encircled Imperial Guard forces to escape, and when fitted with heavy-duty dozer blades or advanced prospecting gear, brutally clearing paths through runes, rubble, vegetation, and corpses to allow heavier battle tanks to follow in their wake. Mechanized infantry regiments are commonly much smaller than infantry regiments on foot. It is difficult for most planetary governors to obtain and maintain the vehicles needed for such formations though larger forces of them have been known. 
The Chimera is the Imperial Guard's most commonly used armored troop carrier. These vehicles are extremely durable and practical, capable of mounting an array of support weapons. Over the millennia, the Chimera has been pressed into service in a variety of different forms, proving its reliability and worth time and again. These ubiquitous workhorses are versatile vehicles capable of operation in hostile environments. Their amphibious design allows them to negotiate dense swamps, marshes, and even rivers. Many an enemy army has been destroyed after thinking their flanks protected by such obstructions, only to find ranks of Imperial Guardsmen, supported by their Chimera's fearsome anti-personnel weaponry, disgorging into the very heart of their position. Employed almost as widely is the Torox. This high-speed transport's rugged quad-track units afforded the ability to negotiate even the most tangled terrain with ease. Axile servo dampeners redistribute the weight of the vehicle across these tracks as it moves, allowing jagged outcrops and uneven piles of rubble to be traversed at full throttle. The variety in local manufacture, the patterns used by supplying forge worlds, and the assets available to a commander in a given war zone mean that a regiment's transport vehicles can vary considerably. There are numerous versions of the Chimera, as well as classified or unorthodox vehicles rumored to drill beneath the surface, all the way up to the super-heavy behemoths. The Bane Hammer and Doom Hammer super-heavy tanks are hulking mobile fortresses, able to carry a large complement of troops into battle, while excelling at defensive anchors and close-range titan killers, respectively. Both variants typically deploy their infantry to occupy the foe's own troops, while the tank's primary weapons target bigger prey. The Stormlord, meanwhile, is a superlative assault vehicle. Whereas most super-heavy transports form part of armored regiments, some Stormlords are intrinsic assets of the mechanized infantry regiments, and it is rumored that entire regiments have been transported inside of them. Embarked inside, Dozens of Imperial Guardsmen level waves of shots at enemies from firing platforms. At the same time, the Stormlord's forward-mounted Vulcan Mega Bolter unleashes such overwhelming sheets of mass reactive rounds into the enemy that, when its steel ramps slam down, the disembarking squads often find naught but settling clouds of vaporized blood. Because of the mobility of mechanized infantry regiments, their support elements must be just as swift and adaptable. Cavalry squadrons from Rough Rider regiments, the foremost of which hail from the world of Attila, are common auxiliary assets in mechanized forces fulfilling numerous target acquisition, vanguard, and long-range scouting roles. They relish the greater dynamism of fighting alongside swift-moving infantry, and often form the spear-tip mass of Chimera assaults, smashing through enemy front lines or shearing their flanks with an oblique charge 
These consummate horsemen plunge their hunting lances into the foe, each bearing one of a variety of deadly fittings. A moment after they break through or veer away, detonations or the hissing roars of melted charges erupt amidst the foe before the rough riders double back for a rapid follow-up assault. Siege and Artillery Regiments Where the sheer volume of heavy ordnance is concerned, few forces in the galaxy can compete with the siege and artillery regiments of the Astra Militarum. Whether on the offensive retaking enemy strong points or defending war fronts miles long, these fighting formations undertake their grim duties with relentless resolve, shelling targets into oblivion as wave after wave of foot soldiers advance to secure victory. The term siege regiment is used by a number of officios and sub-bureau within the Departmento Munitorum to refer to formations specially drilled or equipped to undertake the most grueling of battles. Large numbers of unflinching infantry and vast quantities of artillery of all sizes characterize the majority, though the term has been used at times to label any regiment hurled into high attrition war zones regardless of their suitability. Those unfortunates aside, siege regiments are typically well equipped in terms of ordnance and the sheer numbers needed to overwhelm enemies. Whether tasked with assault or defensive campaigns, the majority of siege regiments are either raised as such from the start of their existence or are reclassified upon the assignment of support elements particularly suitable for grinding battles of endurance. Siege regiments can vary widely in core composition. Depending upon the militarm regimentum they are drawn from, their intended strategies and the breadth or dearth of arms issued to their soldiers. Where a siege infantry regiment stops and an armored artillery regiment begins is open to the interpretation of the officers in command. Many siege regiments rely on overwhelming numbers of foot soldiers and are organized in much the same way as any other infantry regiments. Whereas artillery regiments can be comprised mostly or entirely of artillery tanks and ordnance batteries in a hierarchy more akin to an armored regiment. Both kinds of regiment are sometimes trained in complementary tactics with attached battle tanks or super heavy assets, which are employed to force breakthroughs, initiate counterattacks, timed around bombardments, or closed weakened breaches. In a reflection of the many variations in such regiments' roles, the alternative names they go by are widespread, ranging from combat engineer, trench line or sapper regiments, to bombardier or heavy ordnance regiments. Deafeningly loud, psychologically shattering, and violently destructive, Imperial Guard artillery strikes are feared across the galaxy. Firing patterns are often kept up day and night, 
salvos blasting the foe's defenses, breaking up musterings of enemy troops, and inducing terrible combat fatigue and psychosis. To prevent the enemy learning to predict where and when rounds might fall, artillery commanders frequently alter the firing patterns they use. Field ordnance batteries are deployed in vast numbers by many siege regiments, providing a bedrock of long-range and powerful weapons that most of the regiment's infantry are denied. The battery's component ordnance teams usually comprise a gunner, loader, and gunnery sergeant or junior artillery officer, who together crew the artillery piece. Such batteries may be seconded by other regiments as well. Added to lighter infantry regiments, they usually operate as the heaviest firepower available. While amongst dedicated artillery regiments, their smaller footprint and silhouette enabled them to deploy in dense terrain, impassable to larger artillery tanks. From the large and blunt to the monstrous and baroque, Imperial Guard self-propelled artillery pieces offer a variety of destructive potential. The Basilisk is a mainstay of many artillery regiments. A well-oiled basilisk crew can fire arcing shells from their vehicle's Earthshaker cannon in quick succession, or lower the gun's huge barrel until it is horizontal, turning it into a fearsome direct-fire assault gun. Either singly or in whole batteries, basilisks are common sight supporting infantry and armored assaults. The manticore, meanwhile, carries a limited arsenal of Storm Eagle rockets, each of which unleashes multiple independent warheads before impact, sowing widespread destruction. Siege warfare, as practiced by the Astra Militarum, is amongst the most dehumanizing, miserable, and filth-ridden modes of fighting there is. Attrition figures rocket as dizzying numbers of Imperial Guardsmen are poured into these engagements. Whether manning trench networks that cross continents or storming the foe's own fortifications. Lives are spent every minute wearing down the enemy's resolve and expending their ammunition until they have nothing left with which to resist later Imperial assault waves. Few regiments have the capacity to endure such horror for the months or years it can span without rebellion becoming a serious risk. Legendary regimentos such as the Death Corps of Krieg, Baran Siege Masters, or Torkrati Mire Dredgers are in high demand for their ability to bear losses that would cripple the cohesion of other forces, while still maintaining their fire discipline and willingness to step in the gaps in the line, regardless of the number of fallen comrades they must walk over. Many siege regiments are skilled in combat engineering techniques, sabotaging enemy communications outposts, laying advanced mines in fields of death miles across, or establishing crossings of boggy craters left in the aftermath of repeated shelling. Tunnel networks may be dug in a maze that extends far beneath no man's land, 
enabling teams of veterans to infiltrate behind enemy lines to carry out reconnaissance, assassination, or sabotage missions. Sniper warfare is a common component of siege warfare. Regiments may employ snipers in hidden ruins, perched amongst craters, or sheltering in the carcasses of ruined tanks. Where the regiment itself does not have the marksmen or the weapons for such tactics, they may be assigned to units of abhuman rattlings. These diminutive soldiers are expert shots with their sniper rifles, and their small stature and uncanny ability to remain motionless make them hard for the enemy to locate. Snipers typically aim to kill the war leaders of whichever enemy faces them, adding to the confusion created by artillery bombardments by denying the foe vital links to command. Indeed, long-range kill shots are not limited to infantry marksmen. Lehman Russ vanquishers and other specialist tanks often deploy in hidden gun nests to eliminate priority targets from afar. Infantry Regiments the beating heart of Astra Militarum armies, infantry regiments are raised by almost every world subject to the imperial tithe. Deferring markedly from one regimentum to the next in uniform, training, quality, and equipment, infantry regiment soldiers are instilled with the knowledge that though individuals may fall, there are ten more at their back to avenge them. It is in the taking and holding of ground that Astra Militarum infantry regiments excel. Their primary strength is their huge and expendable mass of soldiers. Opponents attempting to clear out Imperial Guard positions must first survive a blazing hail of las fire backed up by more powerful weapons such as heavy bolters and mortars. A fusillade that can stem the tide of all but the most determined attacks. Attached to primarily armored assaults, meanwhile, infantry companies are vital to protect tanks from enemy saboteurs and to flush out snipers from the protection of cover. During artillery bombardments, supporting infantry engagements, platoons of soldiers guard the vulnerable logistics trains, feeding the artillery batteries, and man the Aegis defense lines that surround gun emplacements, forming halos of iron Plascrete, las guns, and bayonets. Some infantry regiments are categorized by more specialist roles, complemented by additional training, equipment, or the intrinsic skills of their homeworld. Heavy infantry regiments typically deploy in supportive blocks with overlapping fields of fire and are especially well armed. Their infantry squads are more likely to be granted exotic armaments, such as a flamer or plasma gun, and a powerful support weapon, such as the versatile missile launcher or rapid firing autocannon, each crewed by two squad members. These regiments often include entire companies composed purely of heavy weapon squads, ensuring the regiment's infantry are always supported by tremendous firepower, even in terrain that is impassable to tanks. 
heavy infantry regiments may also be assigned auxiliary squads of abhuman ogrins as monstrously effective shock troops. While lacking great intelligence, these massively muscled humanoids are patiently trained to understand orders. Once their strength and resilience is corralled and directed, they are nigh on unstoppable. Formations described as light infantry or skirmishing regiments are usually deployed across large war fronts and dense terrain. Many light infantry regiments specialize in stealth and scout tactics, reconnaissance missions, and unorthodox warfare, using the landscape to its best advantage. They may be from heavily forested worlds, former rangers of mountainous peaks, or recruited from gang cultures in the maze-like underworlds of hive cities. Most light infantry regiments incorporate few transport vehicles or tank companies. Armored support is often limited to heavy weapon squads or the bipedal walking engines known as sentinels. Able to bear a variety of heavy weapons, these nimble single pilot walkers can provide supporting fire for lighter regiments, or serve in reconnaissance roles for the heavier forces. Upon their raising, each regiment is equipped in the manner of their home world. Every guardsman issued with the same style of uniform and weapons as those of their fellow soldiers. Troopers may go to war in full battle dress or little more than primitive armor and tribal tattoos. While ostensibly issued with flak armor, the term is loosely applied to a variety of protection. Imperial Guardsmen in advanced multi-wee fatigues beneath rigid breastplates have marched alongside others in hauberks of synthetic polymer chainmail, swathed in blast-resistant robes, or clothed in hard-wearing greatcoats of heavy, resin-soaked fabric. The only near universal piece of equipment throughout the entirety of the Astra Militarum is the LAS gun. This weapon is cheap and easy to manufacture and extremely reliable. It is therefore ideally suited to arm the massed armies of the Imperial Guard. Many infantry regiments are recruited from worlds with far lower technological bases than exist upon the Imperium's so-called civilized worlds. Others hail from systems where the spoken forms of Imperial Gothic diverge so far from that used by Imperial Quartermasters that any complex instruction in the use of their new firearms would be all but unintelligible. The LAS gun's ease of operation and simple maintenance rituals mean it can be thrust into the hands of factorum laborers, near feral barbarians, and spire born socialites alike. Without fear, its use is beyond any of them. All LAS guns operate on the same basic principles by emitting a beam of focused light. The beam's energy causes the target's immediate surface area to vaporize in a miniature explosion. Lethal against unarmored opposition, the beam's efficacy diminishes with range, and significant armor can shrug off the damage. Where the LAS gun comes into its own 
is in the sheer numbers that the infantry regiments can bring them to bear. The most formidable foe, so maintains the Astra Militarum doctrine, will fall to enough shots. Though lacking the stopping power of physical ammunition, concentrated blizzards of Lazfire can bring down rampaging orcs and tyrannid biohorrors, and, given a timely prayer to the god emperor, an imperial guardsman's lucky shot can even find a weak point in Heretic Astarte's power armor. Their ubiquity means that Laz guns can defer in appearance almost as much as their bearers' uniforms. Constructed on the regiment's home world, on a local industrial world, or even an Adeptus Mechanicus forge world, a huge variety in standard patterns, local sub-patterns, and choice of materials all influence the end product. Some are highly advanced automatic rifles forged from rare materials and housing self-calibrating machine spirits. Others may resemble antiques with stocks crafted from polished ironwood, while millions of cheaply made machine stamped pieces are churned out daily with unfinished edges that can shred the firer's flesh. From shortened carbine style derivatives to multi barreled versions and the long last variant favored by snipers thanks to its extended reach, las guns have appeared in almost every permutation of small arms. Armored Regiments Obliterating the enemies of the Imperium with explosive shells, energy bolts, or hypervelocity munitions, armored regiments are a punishingly effective and sometimes excessive response to invasion and insurrection. In spearheads of plated behemoths, each a steel cathedral to the Emperor's wrath, they crush whatever stands against them beneath their armored tracks. No other Imperial force can field as many tanks as the Astra Militarum. They are churned out in inconceivable numbers from factorums across the galaxy. Many are produced by industrialized worlds as intrinsic component of those planets' own regiments. The laborers taking pride in knowing that their craft will arm and shield soldiers from their own cities. Others, constructed on planets whose entire society is given over to manufacture, may form part of their resource tithe and go towards equipping regiments of other worlds. By far, the most precious and well-crafted are those tanks produced on forge worlds of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Their creation is overseen by adepts of the Omnissiah, the cybernetic machine zealots known as tech priests. These tanks are known for the belligerence of their machine spirits, the reliability of their power cores, and the dread strength of their heavy weapons. While many armored regiments field a homogeneous mass of the same type or pattern of tank, others instead comprise a variety of armored behemoths. The exact composition of a regiment may be a strategic diktat passed down from the Departmento Munitorum, a time-honored tradition by the tithed world, or the result of limited resources. 
tanks play a key role in imperial strategy. And the greatest imperial offensives see armored formations miles in breadth sweep all before them in a rumbling tide. The backbone of armored regiments, battle tanks, are commonly organized into companies of ten vehicles, each comprising a tank commander, or any equivalent title from the Imperium's varied and colorful military nomenclature, and three platoons of three tanks. The battle tanks of the Imperial Guard are constructed according to ancient standard template constructs. These holy designs dictate every aspect of the tank's form and function, and date back to far earlier ages when mankind's technology was at its peak, in some cases even before the coming of the Emperor. In archaic data slates with fading power cells, many of the same war engines that fought alongside humanity in the deep past can be recognized as virtually identical to those that fight the Emperor's enemies today. The Lehman Russ battle tank is one such relic the Imperium's martial history. These war machines are the mainstay of the Astra Militarum's armored forces. Lumbering slabs of armor and intolerance whose inexorable advances crushes foes to bloody ruin. Fitted with a signature battle cannon, every single Lehman Russ is capable facing down almost any battlefield target. Alternatively, sub-patterns of the tank's versatile chassis replace its turret armaments with specialized or rare weapons. Exterminator autocannons, for example, perforate light armor and heavy infantry that dare break cover. While Eradicator Nova cannons unleash irradiated shock waves that pound dug in enemies to ash. Where the various patterns of Lehman Rust tank fulfill a range of aggressive roles, ranging from spearheading all out offensives to countering enemy breakthroughs, the Rogel Dorn battle tanks excel at strong point defense and anchoring battle lines. These mobile firepoints carry either a single enormous oppressor cannon or a twin battle cannon in their turret. Along with heavy weapons in hull and sponson positions that on some other tanks would be classed as primary armaments. Rogel Dorns are amongst the largest battle tanks in Imperial service, capable of enduring withering hails of heavy fire and still answering with devastating salvos of their own. Beyond even the size of the Rogel Dorn, the Astra Militarum's super heavy tanks are gargantuan fighting vehicles each bristling with the firepower of an entire company of Imperial Guardsmen. The technological capacity to construct these massive tanks is increasingly rare, and entire regiments of them are uncommon. More usual for an armored regiment to field individual super-heavy companies squadrons, or loan vehicles that are often attached to other forces. Powered by enormous multi-fuel engines, 
and driven by ferociously bellicose machine spirits, these giant war machines are remnants of the dark age of technology that continue to exemplify the implacability of mankind. The Bane Blade is the most common variant. Its primary weapon is capable of delivering apocalyptic bombardments at a terrifying range. Other patterns grant super heavy tanks dominance in specific roles. From the trimmer shells of the Bane Hammer, whose rippling explosions can cripple highly mobile foes, to the Shadow Swords Volcano Cannon, the ultimate titan killer against which only the most powerful energy fields stand any chance. Scions of the Storm The Tempestus Scions constitute the most elite shock assault corps of the Astra Militarum. Rather than forming a regimentum from a single world, these rigidly disciplined, pious, and professional killers comprise a semi-autonomous arm of the Imperial Guard, one molded by a remorseless recruitment process that forges them into an efficient and deadly whole. Tempestus Scion's training is designed to break, homogenize, and rebuild the orphaned sons and daughters of the Imperial elite. It transforms them from frightened civilians into loyal warriors, ready to fight and die in the name of the Emperor. So conditioned, Tempestus Scions regularly undertake the most arduous and high-profile missions. They strike into the most inhospitable war zones, infiltrate behind enemy lines on recon or assassination forays, and traverse deadly terrain aboard rugged Telrox Primes to rescue lone agents and officials or at least to prize vital intelligence from their dead hands. The genesis of these elite soldiers lies, like many other superior imperial servants, in the training halls, fortified scholums, and drill abbeys of the Scala Progenium. This vast organization takes the young of those imperial servants, typically of noble birth, who have given their lives for the emperor. The orphans are fed, clothed, and educated, but there is no altruism or charity at work in this labyrinthian institution. At the mercy of inflexible instructors, they are indoctrinated with an unswerving adoration for the God Emperor, and undergo brutal regimens of mental, physical, and spiritual conditioning, preparing them for lives of worth to the Imperium. Some may be destined to join the priesthood of the Adeptus Ministorum, or their holy warriors, the Adepta Sororitas. Some may be sponsored for high office within the Administratum, or disappear alongside Inquisitors, or into the black holds of unnamed and warded warships. Of those who survive the scourges of the Scola Progenium's ferocious drill abbots, many of the most physically superior and iron-willed cadets, known formally as progena, once they have graduated, are inducted 
into the regiments of the Militarum Tempestus. Loyal to the Emperor above all else, Tempestus Scions provide Astra Militarum High Command with a core of flexible and adaptable warriors. Supremely confident in their superiority to Orthodox troops. Tempestus Scions are used to enact missions that the regular Imperial Guard cannot accomplish, and are therefore outfitted with some of the best weaponry and war gear available to the Astra Militarum. Each soldier is protected by rigid armaplas and reinforced ceramide plates, and Though some regiments are known to deploy in parade berets strengthened with a dense flak weave, this full carapace armor typically incorporates all enclosing omnishield helms fitted with resk mask arrays. Tempestus scions wield a sophisticated range of high powered weapons that perfectly complement their shock assault role. The standard issue weapon is the hotshot las gun, fitted with a potent external power cell that allows them to penetrate thicker armor than the mass-produced las guns used by rank and file Imperial Guardsmen. When deployed against armored enemy infantry, Tempestus Scions are often equipped with hotshot volley guns. With a more powerful blast and a copious rate of fire, these weapons are perfect for bringing down traitor space marines and large Xenos beasts. The potential of Tempestus Scions is channeled through unwavering duty and obedience, regardless of how inhuman their orders may seem. They are trained to carry out commands with a merciless pragmatism. In many engagements, squads of Tempestus Scions are attached as a near-autonomous asset to other forces. When larger numbers are required, however, the Militarum Tempestist's own command structure takes to the field to marshal their specialized soldiers. Tempestor Primes are officers who have worked their way up through the ranks of the elite regiment that they now lead. Supported by a command squad of veterans and specialists, and having committed to memory thousands of military doctrines. These hard-bitten officers are able to guide their squads on the ground, processing split-second decisions that can mean the difference between mission success and failure. Squads of Tempestus Scions train unstintingly in numerous deployment modes, but perhaps their most celebrated and effective method of arrival is airborne assault using powerful gunships such as the Valkyrie. These atmospheric transports and their flight crews are not technically a part of the Astra Militarum, at least not permanently, though some long-standing relationships have granted some forces dispensation to repaint the aircraft in regimental liveries or camouflage schemes. Rather, they are detached from entire wings of such gunships operated by the Aeronautica Imperialis. This branch of the Imperial Navy fulfills all atmospheric combat duties including air superiority, saturation bombing, tactical ordnance, and orbital transfer. 
missions that are often coordinated via an officer of the fleet. Valkyries are ideal for both insertion of soldiers into fire-swept landing zones and last-ditch evacuations of valued command assets. These aircraft are ruggedly engineered to designs that have endured for uncounted years. They have to be, for they must survive dedicated anti-air firepower on their approach and heavy munitions from ground troops when they use their directional thrusters to slow suddenly, sweeping in as low and graceful as an anti-grav vehicle. Though seen by some generals and Tempestor Primes as purely a means of swift and secure transport, Valkyries are very heavily armed even by the standards of Astra Militarum personnel carriers. A fuselage-mounted LAS cannon or rapid-firing multi-laser gives the aircraft deadly stopping power against other aerial dangers and fortified defenses at the landing zone. This is often supplemented by wing-mounted Hellstrike missiles or multi-shot rocket pods, while additional crew can fire heavy bolters from side hatches. Entering landing zones that are surrounded by enemies is a dangerous tactic, but one often necessary in order to disembark Imperial Guard squads who have not trained for such aerial deployments. Regiments of the Militarum Tempestis, however, are seasoned specialists in high-altitude disembarkation, hurling themselves from a Valkyrie's open ramps in mid-air and employing grav chutes to slow their descent. These troops can perform silent infiltrations of mountaintop fastness. Daredevil drops into icy or desertified plains or rapid strikes into dense vegetation or urban sprawl that defies landing. Tempestus scions have even been known to perform shocking mid-battle insertions in maneuvers that would kill soldiers any less skilled. <laughs> 